No one is a prophet in it's, it's from the Old Testament. No one is a prophet in, in their own land. I see. You can be a prophet somewhere else. People will believe you if you go somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> if, if, if you try to preach and be a prophet in your own land, nobody will believe you or follow you. Tell me, also I remember asking you a few times, why don't you share experiences? And you also mentioned very nicely that, you know, it's an ego boost. And some people, there can be a animosity or... Exactly, ends. I remember, yeah. So wanting yes. to avoid, and I remember saying, no, Swami wants us to share your experiences so other people should know. Yes. Uh, you know, Rajmi, you are absolutely right. Sojourns wishes to thank Jacksonville psychiatrist Dr. Jose Gomez for agreeing to finally share some of his lessons learned and experiences received from holy man Sri Satya Sai Baba. Thank you so much, Ted. Um, before I share with you uh, s some of those thoughts, I would like to thank you for giving me this opportunity to share with the rest of the world some of my experiences as a Baba devotee. A lot of people might want to wonder <coughs> or ask you, where do you split your allegiance between Jesus and Baba? Another miracle from Swami. <laughs> it was so beautiful. Okay. Everything changed in my life. Everything. Everything. I used to have a very bad temper. People who know me now, after Sai Baba, don't believe that. They cannot imagine me with a bad temper. I used to be a very angry person. I was angry at the whole world. I was that was one of the big changes that I experienced. Now instead of being angry, I have been more peaceful. I am more loving. I am more uh, interested in helping people. Before it was mostly me, me, me. There are many things that I can say about this transformation, but the main thing is the inner happiness and peace that I live every single day from day to day that has for me no price, that I couldn't find and I will never find anywhere but in Swami. Dr. Gomez was raised in the Dominican Republic. He has been a Sai Baba devotee for years. And as a professional now practicing in the United States, he has published and won national awards for books he has written on how to grow and flourish in life. First and foremost, I would like to thank my spiritual teacher, Bhagavan Sri Satya Sai Baba of India. Welcome to Soul Journeys. This interview was recorded in Jacksonville, Florida in December of 2013. When I was an adolescent, I wanted to be a Catholic priest. And I was for about a year and a half preparing to become a Jesuit. Just like the Pope is a Jesuit. Yes. <laughs> and after that time, I started to read about Eastern philosophy, and I learned about a few strange things for me at that time, such as reincarnation and karma and Lord Shiva and those things like that. And I felt so attracted to it that I had to tell my supervisor that I liked it, that I believed in that, and he just told me, Jose, you know, if you are a Catholic priest, you cannot read or talk or believe about those things. You have to make a choice. So I made the choice to follow my heart. And I decided to leave the idea of being a Catholic priest. The idea of being, that's a very interesting <laughs> word you use there. Yes. But you still wanted to be, in so many words, let's say, Let's use the word priest as a euphemism for a spiritual aspirant. Exactly. Practitioner. Exactly. Exactly. And that's who you became. Yes. <laughs> that's great. So I went to medical school. I did pretty well. As a physician, I was very successful in my mid to late 30s. I was already the director of a medical school in my country. Very successful doing very well economically, very um, devoted to my profession, but deep down, 
I felt an emptiness. I felt I was missing something because I was not so much connected anymore with my spirituality. I was completely and totally into being a successful psychiatrist. One word on this, it sounded to me as if you were going to tell me, Ted, after I decided to drop out of the seminary, the route to becoming a Catholic priest, I decided to pursue another spiritual avenue. But you didn't, you went right into medicine. Yes. But you still had this burning desire. Exactly, which I put aside for a while, unfortunately, and I became involved in the glamour of being a, of being a professor, of directing a medical school, writing papers, all of those things that changed my direction in life, and I just became someone who wanted to have prestige, money, <laughs> material things. The American dream. Reputation, the American dream, exactly. <laughs> and I got it. At a very young age, age, I got a lot of it. But what year is this? I was probably in my mid to late 30s. It must have been in the early 60s. And I should point out that you went on to get your medical degree and that, if I understand correctly, you're a practicing psychiatrist today here in Jacksonville. Yes, okay. I am. I am. But this is what happened. After doing well in all of those things, one day I was feeling almost depressed. I thought, if this is what life is going to be all about for the rest of my life, just working, making money, buying material things, I don't think that I want that. I don't know what I want, but I don't want that. I, I, I am tired of it. So I went to a um, store, bookstore, Barnes and Noble, looking for a book. I, I have always been very fond of reading books, and I thought, there has to be a book that I could read that will give me inspiration and new meaning in my life because I don't have that now. And I went through, I went to the section of New Age, which is something that I like, to psychology. I couldn't find anything. But I then, when I was about to leave, with four books under my arm about tarot and some other things like that, I looked up at the top shelf and I saw this book with this strange looking individual with a big afro <laughs> and a, an orange shrub and I thought who is this and then I saw the title a Catholic priest meets Sai Baba because I was going to be a Catholic priest I knew Catholic priests don't don't meet don't believe don't look for anyone or anything other than Jesus Christ how can a Catholic priest meet someone other than Jesus? So I went and got the book. I glanced through it, appeared very interesting, put the other books back, went to the cashier, paid for that, and I stay up until 5 a.m. that night. I couldn't put it down. I bought it around 8 or 9 o'clock that night. I just couldn't put it down. I read and read and read and read. Even the following day, because I couldn't finish it, when I went to work, I had it in my drawer. In between patients, any time they left and came, five, ten minutes in between patients, I got and read a little bit. I was fascinated by that book. Isn't it the most, one of the most loving books you've ever read? Oh my God, yes. And because I was Catholic, and because I was going to be a Catholic priest, that was the perfect book for me. Yeah. So after I finished reading that book, I thought, I need to know more about this Sai Baba. I need to get more books about him. So I went back to Barnes & Noble next day, and I asked them about having more books about Sai Baba. And they said, Sai Baba, no, we, we don't sell those books here. I said, well, but you know, I bought a book yesterday by this title. Then he, the, the, the gentleman went to the computer. No, I'm sorry. A Catholic <laughs> priest meets Sai Baba by, by Mario Mazzolini has never been sold here. <laughs> we don't have it. Oh 
And I tell him, but look, I even have the receipt <laughs> in my house. I bought it here last night. <laughs> and he went up and he said, no, you must be confused. You, maybe you went across the, the street to another uh, store there, uh, Books a Million, mm -hmm. and maybe you bought it there. I said, well, okay, that's fine. So that was very puzzling to me. At that time, I didn't know anything about Lila's Baba's miracles and yeah. Lila's, uh, nothing. <laughs> How can they say that? How can they be so messed up and confused that they don't have it even in their computer when I know I came here, I bought it here, I have the receipt at home. And they are saying, no, they never sold those books. So I asked one uh, friend of mine who has been into different groups here in, in Jacksonville. I said, have you heard about Sai Baba? He said, yes. There is a group here, it's an, a small group that meets every week and I can introduce you to the president of that group so you can maybe learn some more about Sai Baba. I said, great. So I got the name and the phone number of the president at that time of the Sai Baba group in Jacksonville and I called him and I told him, um, I have read this book, a Catholic priest meets Sai Baba and I would like to learn more about this person. He said, okay, I'll be happy to introduce you to the group, but first I need to explain some things to you because they do some strange things there <laughs> and I don't want you to be culturally shocked and then never come back again, as it has happened sometimes with some of the non-Indian people going to that group. I said, okay, that's fine. Um, tell me what I need to know and when do they meet and I would like to go to the next um, meeting they have. And he said, well, uh, that, that is not possible. Uh, I am busy for at least two to three weeks. I cannot talk to you and meet with you for at least two to three weeks. Maybe in about a month you can come to the group. I almost went crazy. <laughs> I was so thirsty and eager to know about Swami and to wait one whole month. It was going to be like waiting one whole year. So I said, look, Bill, I don't know when you can have some time for me. I will go anywhere you want. I will meet with you anytime you can, but give me at least a few minutes of your time. Tell me what I need to know, and I will be there next week. So he kept saying no, I kept insisting. So he saw that he was so determined and so firm about wanting to be in the group next week, that finally said, okay, okay, uh, tomorrow we'll come to your house um, with my wife and we will explain to you all the things that you need to know. And then when he came, he said, I got a book for you. Another book. Another book. The same book. Oh. <laughs> he came with a book. He said, I got this book that I thought it might be a good book for you. The name is A Catholic Priest Meets Sai Baba. And I thought, oh my God, you know, this is exactly the same book that I read that I got me so interested in Sai Baba. So he was surprised because he knew that I was a psychiatrist and he was planning to bring the one about psychiatry by Sandwise uh -huh. and finally he decided, no, I'm going to bring this one. <laughs> anyway, this is how I got into knowing about Swami. At that time, I started going to the center on a regular basis, every week, no failures, every single week I was there. And the strange things that he was telling me was that people take their shoes off, <laughs> people clap a lot, people sing in very strange languages that you don't understand. They never say hello or goodbye, they say sairam to everything. So you need to know all of that before you go there. <laughs> so I was introduced to that and it was fine with me, you know, no big deal, no big problem. And this is when I decided that I needed to go to India. Wow, you were pretty early <laughs> in the game, though. Yes. I desire to go to India already. I already had the urge to meet this Sai Baba person that was to me so attractive. Was it the influence of the group? Was it the influence of Don Mario Mazzolini's book? What was it that really gave you that extra? <laughs> yes. The book gave me the initial desire to meet Swami. 
But as I learned, I, and I was reading every book that I could find, everybody was lending me books, and I was devouring them. And in those days, there was not such a thing as a CD or DVD. There were those things that you might remember, cassettes. V yes, and VHS cassettes. And yes. VHS. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I was just learning as much as I could. And that triggered the desire, the intense desire, to meet Swami. That was, oh, let me tell you one more thing about the book. Yeah. Very interesting thing. Um, I remember after a few weeks after reading the book, I remember, and I read it a few times, back and forth. I remember the second or third time, I remember reading something about a festivity called Guru Purnima. Mm -hmm. I had no idea. I never heard that name, Guru Purnima. And I read that this is the time, this is the day when the disciple pay love and give respect to their guru, to their spiritual teacher. And that is usually celebrated in the month of July each year. So out of curiosity, I thought, well, let me see when the Guru Purnima Day fell this year. I think it was 1967. And when I went back and looked in the calendar when was Guru Purnima on that year, it was exactly on the same day that I bought that book. <laughs> You're talking about Don Mario's book. Yes. yes. Let me ask you one other question about that before we move on. This is going to be a wonderful series of interviews, I believe. I don't think we'll be able to contain it in just one. <laughs> um, I love the book for many reasons, but for those who haven't read it, this Catholic priest loves Sai Baba. He loves Jesus. He loves the Catholic Church. Everything's fine, except at the Vatican, where they won't allow that. Long story short, they excommunicate Don Mario Mazzolini from the priesthood. He's no longer a priest, a public priest, acting priest. He includes in that book, if, as you recall, the letter of excommunication from the Vatican and his letter of acceptance, which I found to be one of the most loving documents I think I've ever read in my life, the humility, grace, yes. compassion, and love that he displayed in the letter accepting his excommunication. Yes. Did it hit you that way? Oh, absolutely. Because in a way, I went through that when they told me that I had to choose being 17 or 18 years old in between Catholic Church and my beliefs in reincarnation and karma and all of those things. Mm. It hit home. They were forcing you out? Yes. This way or the highway? Exactly, exactly, exactly. But I had to be very loyal to my convictions. And what was in my heart was what I was, this new world that I was discovering that I never knew anything about. No regrets. No regrets. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, so let's take it then the next step up. You're in India. I assume you finally got to India and you saw Sai Baba. What was your initial impression? Oh my God. Tell me about that very first visit. In my very first visit and in my very first darshan, as I was looking at Swami coming from the lady's side towards the men's side, I just started to cry like a baby. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh, but I, this, I've heard this so many times from Jody. <laughs> and even right times. now, I get very emotional talking about that because I felt very embarrassed because I thought, what are all the people going to think about me? Did you look around and see others crying? I, no. <laughs> but I was so impacted by Swami and the only thing that went like a tape recorder over and over and over in my thoughts was, he's God, he's God, he's God. Where did this come from? I am pretty sure that it was my soul recognizing who he truly was. And you know, I am so surprised sometimes when I hear people doubting of the divinity of Swami, doubting whether he's God or not, 
Because to me, right from the beginning, that was a fact. I, I had no questions, I have no doubts. And sometimes people say, uh, and I feel very hurt when I hear those things. Even Baba devotees, they say, oh, he's a great saint. He's a highly evolved soul. He's a magnificent teacher, things like that. But they don't believe he's God. To me, right from the beginning, as soon as I saw him, my mind went crazy affirming that he was God. Doesn't it appear that we're all tuning forks? And some of us, not me, but you, might be a highly tuned tuning pork, pork that can pick up on this that others of us can't because we haven't had the previous lifetime awareness preparing us? Very likely. Very likely. And I'll share something with you and with those who are going to be uh, watching this video. Um, Swami revealed to me, I, I have had a couple of interviews and several talks in the veranda, but Swami revealed to me that because of my previous worship to Lord Shiva when I was living in India, he promised me that he was going to accept me and call me during a lifetime, this lifetime, to know him, to know Lord Shiva through him. So it was destiny. You had no choice. No, no. That was decided by him. Who knows when? I, I, he's aware of all my past lives. I, I don't know. But he, he told me that. You do know. Uh, somewhat. <laughs> <laughs> somewhat, yes. Then is there anything else remarkable that you can think of that you'd like to share from that first encounter? You were yes. probably back too many lines back for him to catch your eye or say anything to you, but were you impressed one way or the other of the magnitude of the crowd, their devotion? Did you see others crying? And did you notice anything else about Baba? When I went there for the very first time, I was not aware at all of anything else but Baba. I couldn't look anywhere else but him. I couldn't focus my mind into anything going on other than him. I was just hypnotized by him. I was constantly looking at him, thinking of him, feeling his presence, feeling his love. and. I remember, because I was not used to sitting down that long in a cross-legged position, <laughs> after I don't know how many hours of sitting there and looking at him fascinated, when I wanted to get up, when Darshan was over and I wanted to get up, I fell on the floor. <laughs> I couldn't get up. My legs were totally numbed and not working. So two gentlemen side by side had to pick me up and help me to get up because I don't know how long was it, but I just know that all the time that w Baba was in front of me, I was just fascinated. I had no pain. At the beginning, I, have a I had a little bit of physical pain in my legs, but after a while, even the pain went away and I was just, just there in total communion with him, just looking at him. Oh. It was wonderful, wonderful. But you know, there is something interesting. Up to that point, all the books that I read from all the people who wrote books, they all had interviews with Swami. If you read all of those people who were writing the first books, they all had interviews with Swami. And because I only read those books, I thought, well, you go to put a party, you have an interview with Swami, and then you go back home. <laughs> That's the way things are going to happen. All 85,000 of you. Yes. <laughs> So I went there with the expectation, even though I was told that I shouldn't have the expectation of having an interview, I knew that in my mind, in my brain, but deep down in my heart, I wanted an interview with Swami. I thought that is what is supposed to happen. So I went there and it didn't happen. So I came back home a little bit discouraged, uh, a little bit sad, feeling a little bit rejected and neglected because I knew that was going to happen. That is the normal thing to do. And I, you're a psychiatrist, so maybe it was a little bit of ego too. Yeah, of course, <laughs> of course. Look. I'm here. Yes, I'm yes, here. yes. <laughs> and um, I kept going and going two, three times every year for four years, all the time hoping. Two or three times every year? Two or three times every year. 
I went not only to see him, that was the main reason, of course, but I went to the general hospital to do service as a physician there to the poor people from around Puttaparthi. Not as a psychiatrist, but as a medical physician? Yes, doctor. mostly as a medical doctor, mostly in general medicine, because most Indians don't have any medicine. Sick for psychiatrists. <laughs> they, they, if, if they have any emotional or mental problems, they go to the priest. Mm -hmm. And the priest will bring them to me in the hospital. Few of them, not too many. So I did mostly general medicine, you are right, but a few cases of, of psychiatry was also uh, seen by me. So after four years and so many visits, finally one day, he came straight where I was sitting in the veranda, stood in front of me, looked at me, pointed at me, and he said, go. <laughs> As he but usually does. By that does. time, you had heard that word a thousand <laughs> times. Yeah. The I, right people. Yeah, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> I just couldn't believe it. I mean, so many times waiting for that moment, and when it came, I, I, I didn't stand up. I didn't do anything. I, I just froze and quietly look around to see if he was talking to the one behind me or next to me. No, nobody appeared to be moving, so I thought, maybe it's me. So he said for a second time with um, uh, more firm, go. <laughs> then I thought, yeah, it's me. So I got up and went to um, the front uh, porch before going into the um, interview room. It was quite an experience. Um, when I was inside the room, I was just so grateful and so happy that Swami was giving me that opportunity to be with Him one-on-one. -on -one. Actually, we were about seven, seven people there. Just seven. Normally, there's many more than that. Yeah, no, only seven. I was number seven. There were three couples and me mm -hmm. alone. At that time, I was not married to Carmen yet. I, I was uh, single. Mm -hmm. So I went in, and he started calling the other couples one by one, and spending a good amount of time with them in the second smaller room, mm -hmm. the more private room. So you'd sit out in the general, the main room. Exactly. And wait for. And wait for him to call us. <clears throat> So he called the first couple, spent, I don't know, maybe half an hour, which to me was like three hours. <laughs> I couldn't wait for him to come out. <laughs> and then he goes and calls the second couple. And then I thought, oh my God, will he call me to go inside there with him? Maybe this is it. Maybe this is all that I, what I'm going to get. But maybe I will be the next one. He comes out again calls the third couple, I said, oh yeah, I know, I knew it. <laughs> this is as much as I'm going to get, but this is fine. I have been in the presence and the closeness with God, that's fine. So I kind of accepted the fact that he was not going to call me in. When the third couple came out, he called me. I was so happy. I thought, oh my God, I can't believe this. So I went inside the room and he asked me a question that he often asks to most people. What do you want? And I don't remember exactly what I told him, but I know that I was so nervous and my mind was so spacey. And uh, you know, when you are in the presence of God, when you are in the presence of Swami, your mind doesn't work the way it usually does. You, you are dumb, you, you are a kind of in another world. Your thoughts doesn't flow well. So uh, when he asks, what do you want? I don't even know what I told him. But I knew after I came out of the interview that I might have said something very dumb, something not really that smart. And then he told me, oh, yes, yes, I know, I know. And then we went to talk about a few other things. I came out, feeling in another world. When I came out, I couldn't find my place in the veranda. It was right there in front of my eyes. I couldn't see my, 
cushion. There were only about 10 to 15 people there because everybody left thinking it's too late. So I mean, it's not, it's not going to come out and call anybody else. So most people left. And even there were only 10, 15 people and a few cushions empty. I couldn't find my place because I was just floating in, in another world. So finally I saw my cushion. I went there and I thought, if I am ever called by Swami again, when he asks me, what do you want? I will make sure that I give him a very smart, intelligent answer that he will be proud of me. So I kept going back and going back and going back. And about four years later, he calls me back again. Mm -hmm. At that time, I was already married to Carmen. Mm -hmm. And this is what happened during that second interview. It was so interesting because when he came as he usually did, he was walking at that time, he came through the lady's side and he, when he was passing in front of Carmen, who was sitting in the so-called first arch, very close to where he was passing by, he stopped right in front of her and kept looking at her and looking at her and looking at her very intense and then turned around and left. All the ladies around my wife, Carmen, went, oh, Carmen, uh, Swami was looking at you so much. Oh, you're so lucky. Oh, my God, you're so easy. Look at you. Yeah, she was, you know, so excited about that. And he, ke he, he kept walking straight to the men's side. But instead of doing the kind of round that he usually mm -hmm. does, he went straight to the veranda, which he doesn't do too often. And he went straight in front of me. And then he stood in front of me and he says, wife, wife. And sometimes we can be so dumb. <laughs> I had been married to Carmen for about five or six months only. That my first thought when Wami says, wife, my first thought was, how does he know that I have a wife? <laughs> I didn't see what happened all the way back there with the ladies, but... And then I thought, there, Swami, there. And he says, I know, I know, go. <laughs> so I got up, and as soon as my wife from the ladies' side saw me coming, then she got up, and then we went both to the interview. The friends around her must have been just shocked. Yes. That after looking at her for so long, yes. she then got up and went. Yes, exactly, exactly. Without exactly. him telling her to go. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Amazing. Yes, yes. So we waited our turn. There were a few other couples there, too. And we were called in to the second most intimate room, just mm -hmm. the two of us and Swami. And I am, while we were, we were waiting before going into the intimate room, I am rehearsing in my mind. You know the answer this time. Yes, <laughs> I'm going to say the right answer. When he asks, what do you want? I'm going to say something like, your love, Swami, or whatever you want to give me, Swami, or whatever you give me is fine with me, Swami. I don't have something like that. So I'm rehearsing all of that, rehearsing, rehearsing, making sure that I'm going to say something smart so when I get in front of him, he talks to me first before talking to Carmen. And he asks me a question. <laughs> How is business? <laughs> <laughs> How can I say whatever you want from me, Swami? It didn't match. My, my preconceived answer didn't go along with it. How is business? So I was thrown by that. He knew all of that that was going through my mind, I'm sure. So he threw me this totally unexpected question and threw me totally out of balance. And then I thought, oh my God, when I was fumbling and, and looking for an answer, <laughs> he goes very lovingly and very understanding. Oh, I know, I know, but don't worry your business problems are going to be over 
in September. No, no, in October, <laughs> he changed. You hadn't even mentioned business problems, I'm sure. I had no idea I had any business oh, you problems. Didn't know you had any problems. I thought my business was doing great. <laughs> so. Did that ruin your trip for you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll I, I tell you, this is what happened. I, I, I thought, well, okay, Swami, thank you. And then we went into other things. He asked Carmen. How are your children? She was never married before she married me. She never had any <coughs> children. Mm -hmm. And I had children from a previous marriage, not with her. <coughs> so when he's asking her, how are your children? She says, Swami, I have no children. He stays quiet. We talked a little bit about a few other things. And then he says again, how are your children? So she's surprised and says, Swami, I don't have any children. Then we talked a little bit about a few other things again. And for the third time he goes, how are your children? At that time we are both, Carmen and I were very confused. What is it that he's asking about her children when we both know she has no children? Then she says again that she has no children. And then Swami asks her, what is your profession? She's a pediatrician. Oh. <laughs> She's a pediatrician. She's a pediatrician? And She's then, got yeah. Hundreds of children. And then she says, I'm a pediatrician, Swami. I, I heal children. <laughs> then Swami says, Those are your children. Oh, Meaning, wonderful treat sure. those children like your own children. And I'm sure she does. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And then, he went on and materialized a beautiful Vibhuti box, beautiful piece of jewelry, silver with all kinds of jewels, mm -hmm. rubies and diamonds, full of Vibhuti. Is this for Carmen? For Carmen. Oh. Yeah. Because she has been having a lot of back pain. <coughs> and when he asked her, if she had any problems, if she had any pain, she said, no, 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 Swami, I'm okay. And he told her, no, you are not okay, but I'll give you a gift. And then oh. later on, he materialized that beautiful Vibhuti box. So he told her he knew that she was not exactly. okay. Exactly. And gave her a way to find solace and healing. Yes, yes. And that Vibhuti bo box, she was eating that Vibhuti every day for two or three days, and any time it got empty, it would refill again by itself. Oh. All the time. She had enough Vibhuti from him for two to three days. Never to say that that pain and that condition, <coughs> that problem, she had a condition, she had mm -hmm. some medical condition, went away forever mm. with that Vibhuti that she was using during that time. See, I'm always hesitant to ask that last part of the question because you never know. Sometimes yes. Swami has another yes. reason Yes. Pain to linger or whatever yes. it might be. Yes, absolutely. That's, that's a great story. A couple of quick questions while we have a, <coughs> a natural break here. You mentioned you're on the veranda. I forgot to mention that you were born and raised, presumably, in uh, the Dominican Republic. Yes, in I did. The Dominican Republic. And how old were you when you came to uh, America? I was 26. Okay, so you were a young man. Yes. An adult. Yes. And uh, I'm just going to take a guess. It's okay to talk about these things now because it's history, and that is since Sai Baba's Mahasamadhi, uh, VIPs don't gather as they once did on the veranda to be closer to his physical form. Yes. Uh, and there you were. So was that because you were a physician? Was that because you did so much seva as a physician at Puttaparthi? Was that because you might have held some uh, good rank among Sai Baba executives here in America, or was it for some other reason? You know, I am so <coughs> happy that you are asking me that question because there is another Lila connected with me being there. <laughs> this is what happened. I'm going, I'm getting ready to go for the first time there. There is a lady in the Sai Baba group who had been there three times. She had gotten three interviews with Swami each time, and I knew she was a well-qualified well person <laughs> to tell me what to do in Puta Party when you get there. So I asked her uh, if she knew where I needed to go. She said, well, you are a doctor, 
And I think doctors sit in a special place. I don't think that you need to sit <coughs> with everybody else. So when you get there, try to find out where doctors will sit. I came there, I knew nobody, I couldn't ask anybody, I, 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 I am not, I, I tend to be a shy person, I couldn't ask anyone, so I thought, well, I'll see if I know any doctors, and wherever they sit, if I can find any doctors that I know, I'll see if I can sit there. <laughs> so I saw one doctor, the only doctor that I knew at that time, Dr. Michael Ghosting. <laughs> <laughs> the head of the American Sai Baba organization. Exactly. And worldwide Sai Baba organization eventually, yes. Exactly. So I thought, oh, I know Dr. Goldstein. I'll just follow him, and wherever he sits, I'll sit there. And Can you imagine sits, that? He usually sits right beside Baba or real close to Baba. <laughs> exactly. You knew what you were doing. So I had no idea what I was doing, but. I saw him in a line. At that time, even those very, very, very VIPs used to form a line uh -huh. in a special place and go inside through a special door, little yeah. door, that we still do and probably you know. So I went into that line with a few other people that I didn't know, and I just followed the line. They all went to different places. Of course, Dr. Goldstein went to the very, very front, very close to Swami. And I just <coughs> stayed in the middle to watch the back with the rest of the other people, thinking, well, most of those, these people here must be doctors too. I'll just sit with them. I didn't know who they were. And as I'm looking to some of those in the front, I see someone saying, that is Howard Murphy. Ooh. That is Jack Hislop. Oh my goodness. And then I start thinking, they are not doctors. Am I sitting in the right place? <laughs> Maybe I don't belong here. So I started kind of very scared about being reprimanded by being in the wrong place and being Mr. Nobody because nobody knows me. And I started kind of moving back towards the back of the <laughs> whole group in the veranda. And then I sat at the very, very last row, very scared, waiting <coughs> for any time the Sebadal will come to me and say, who are you? What are you doing here? This is not your place, you go. Because at that time, even the doctors were not sitting in the veranda at that time. They later on mm -hmm. was negotiated, they would come to the veranda. But at that time they were sitting in a special place, but with the general public, mm -hmm. but not in the veranda. In a lower VIP level. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yes, so I, I, I was there very scared of being thrown out f to my embarrassment because of what I did, but the Sevadal never came. And then I thought, well, if it happened one time, <laughs> maybe I can keep trying in the same group, same line, same little door, same place in the back, <laughs> And maybe nobody will notice that um, somebody new and strange there that maybe doesn't need to be there, but who is there anyway. I did that for years. <laughs> <laughs> for many, many, you know, and then uh, after maybe, maybe after a year or two, someone from South America, whose father was the president of his country and very close to Swami, we got to talk a little bit and I said, look, I don't know why I am sitting here. I thought this was the doctor's place. Now I know they are somewhere else. Nobody have noticed and I know how particular the Sevadals are in inquiring who sits there. And they never bothered about inquiring who I was. So I told him, look, I don't know why I am here why nobody has said anything, why they are not throwing me away from this place, but as long as I can keep coming here, I'll keep coming. He said, I'll give you the answer that Swami gave my dad a few years ago when he was pulled. 
the father of this gentleman, who was a former president of a country, was sitting with the general public way, way back there. And Swami went all the way, parting the crowds, took him by the hand, and took him to the veranda with his son, the one who was talking to mm -hmm. me, and sat him in the veranda and told him the Sevadal in charge at that time, this is where he needs to sit from now on. And then some of the people there started saying, who is he? Why is he here? Why Swami took the body to go the way there mm -hmm. and take him by his hand here? Something I've never seen him do. Yes, yes. And then Swami who knows everything and hears everything and he was leaving the place, turned back and told those people who were kind of mm -hmm. almost gossiping. Why? You know? Swami said, anyone who sits here is because that person has been serving me for many lifetimes. There you go. That's your answer you were looking for. So he told me that. He said, maybe this is what you have done. I said, oh my God. <laughs> okay. <laughs> If that is his will, sight am. <laughs> you know, this leads me to uh, one of the most important questions that we've discussed ahead of this interview that I want to ask you, but it seems to me you may have already answered it, but I want to ask it anyway. And it's one of the main questions I ask people, and you suggested it for me right at the top of those points to consider. Normally I say, how has coming to Sai Baba transformed your life? And you refer to that as the single greatest miracle in your life. So even though you've already mentioned much to us, maybe it's, maybe it's helping you to become aware that you've been on this path for eons, for hundreds of lifetimes for all you know. But in your own words, how has Sai Baba transformed your life? Before knowing Swami, I was very empty, as I said before, looking for a spirituality, looking for God, but not finding the right way to express that, the right channel to do it. And being a psychiatrist, I would say I was probably, using a medical term, subclinically depressed almost depressed, clinically, almost clinically depressed for many years because I had neglected my spiritual side of me that was so important during my younger years. I abandoned that completely and although I was very successful, as I said before, in many other ways, I was very unhappy. When I was called by Swami, all of a sudden I became a happy person, my life again had meaning, I had a lot of energy, almost every day by 10 o'clock I was tired of working and living. <laughs> I felt tired mm -hmm. of what my life was going to be for the rest of that day. After meeting Swami, I look forward every day, every day I have something new, something good, something to look for, something that I'm happy about, I have a lot of energy. So the new meaning that Swami gave to my life, the new happiness that I have now is something that has no price, no price. It sounds like it's without, without actually over um, describing it or exaggerating, a total life transformation. Oh, absolutely. I haven't heard maybe anybody or too many people describe such a transformation. Oh, absolutely. Everything changed in my life. Everything. Everything. I used to have a very bad temper. People who know me now, after Sai Baba, don't believe that. They cannot imagine me with a bad temper. I used to be a very angry person. I was angry at the whole world. I was angry at myself. I was angry at my life. And I was angry at everyone else. So, um, 
that was one of the big changes that I experienced. Now, instead of being angry, I have been more peaceful. I am more loving. I am more uh, interested in helping people. Before it was mostly me, me, me. And, you know, maybe th there are many things that I can say about this transformation, but the main thing is the inner happiness and peace that I live every single day from day to day that has for me no price, that I couldn't find and I will never find anywhere but in Swami. That is for me is, is the most precious miracle. He has done a lot of things. We could be talking here for two or three more hours because we haven't even touched the tip of the iceberg. Well, we will be in a manner of speaking. It's, and it just dawned on me. We're sitting here with Ravi and Rashmi Goyal, mm -hmm. both doctors. Rashmi's a retired psychiatrist. And here we are with you, a psychiatrist. And it sounds like your transformation came because of your going to Baba, the psychiatrist from the Saul, yes. who's able to transform us if only we listen if only we put ourselves in the right frame of mind. And many of us struggle with that part of the equation every day, but for you it came not only naturally, but sounds like almost instantly. Yes, yes, absolutely. And, and maybe time for one last question in this segment, and that is back to your roots again. You know, you and I were both raised Catholic, and I love my faith very much, and you continue to pursue it as a seminarian en route to become a Catholic priest until, as you mentioned, you veered away from that for a very good reason. And I wanted to find out how you reconcile that today. A lot of people might want to wonder <coughs> or ask you, where do you split your allegiance? Do you split your allegiance? And how do you, if you do, between Jesus and Baba? Another miracle from Swami. <laughs> it was so beautiful. I have been reading, thinking, meditating about Swami for maybe only two or three months. And I read somewhere, Swami wants you to be, if you're a Catholic, wants you to be a better Catholic. If you're a Jew, wants you to be a better Jew. If you're, you know that, we, we all know about that. So I thought, well, if Swami wants me to be a better Catholic, at that time I was not much into the Catholic religion much anymore. So I thought, if he wants me to be a better Catholic, I better start going back to the Catholic Church again. I used to go there every day, have communion every day, not every Sunday like most every people do, day. every day. So I thought, let me start by going every Sunday. So I went one Sunday to the Catholic Church close to my house here in Jacksonville. And I was having this strong love for Swami, three months into Swami. And at the same time, I am looking at Jesus in the cross, a big cross in the altar. And I am thinking, oh my God, Jesus, I am betraying you. Now I am changing my love to you. You have been always my spiritual leader. Now I am changing you for Sai Baba. And I feel, and I feel so guilty about it. And I didn't know what to do with those two feelings because I have always been Catholic and Christian and loved Jesus, but I have this strong love for Sai Baba too. How can I reconcile that? I didn't know what to do. I was struggling in my mind as I was looking at the cross. And as I am looking at the cross, a miracle happened. Mm. I am looking at the head, the face of Jesus. And then all of a sudden, that head, that face starts to fade away, to disappear. And in its place, Sai Baba's face starts appearing, forming there. And I am going like, what? And then I rub my eyes, like trying to take that illusion from me, because what was there, it was Jesus, the body of Jesus, with the face and the head of Sai Baba. You were conscious, you were awake, this wasn't a dream. Totally awake, it was not a dream, it was not with the eyes closed, I shook my head several times, I even thought, oh my God, I think that I am too much with my patients, I am becoming psychiatric myself, I need to, to get some rest or something, because this is, I am having hallucinations. All of those thoughts came through my mind. And then after maybe, I don't know how long it was, it might have been like two or three minutes probably, 
then again, Baba's face disappeared, and I looked around all the time, and I looked, trying to, to take away that image. It didn't go away. It stayed there. And then finally it disappeared, but I didn't know what to make out of it. My Jesus, first Jesus' face came back. Yes, Jesus' face came back, and everything went back to normal, but I was confused. I, I thought, I really thought, to, to be quite honest, I thought I was having visual hallucinations. Being a psychiatrist, that was the normal logical explanation. And I thought, oh my God, you know, I, I would never imagine that anything like that could happen to me. But nevertheless, when I went, that was on a Sunday. When I went back to the Sci Center on a Thursday, I talked to the president. I said, you know, this is what happened to me. I don't know what to make out of it. And then he explained to me, well, you know, Baba has all forms and all names. Jesus, Buddha, Allah, Krishna, Sai Baba, they are all the same. Because you were having this struggle, not knowing that they were all the same, thinking that if you change from Jesus to Baba, you are betraying Jesus because you are following now Baba. You didn't know that was all the same. You follow Baba, you are following Jesus. You are following Jesus, you are following Baba, no problem. Same thing. So I said, oh my God, thank you so much. Then I felt relieved. And I am glad to share that because I have been in places talking to people who had the same kind of a struggle. They want to follow Jesus or another deity, and they don't know that by following Baba, they're following the same deity. So anyone watching this video, please know that all forms and all names are Baba's names and Baba's forms. There's no contradiction. On this note, we're going to end this session. Uh, Dr. Jose Gomez here in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, Jody and I have to prolong our visit to Jacksonville so we can come back and rap on your door for interview part two, if it's okay <laughs> with you. It will be wonderful. These are wonderful stories for a couple of reasons, but one very important reason is I have a feeling there are many people uh, around the country, around the world who might see this, who will be able to relate to your experiences in meaningful ways that will help them. Yes. As well as your stories teaching the rest of us, which is the primary way, I think, in which these interviews can be used. Thank you very much. God bless you. We're ahead Thank of you. Christmas coming up, so Merry Christmas. Yes. Happy Baba birthday. Yes. In Sairam. Thank you. Sairam. Some, like, not knowing what to do, people like you, and maybe one or two more people individually and yeah, probably. But I, I personally thought it was your to do is excellent. Those kind of things. Yeah. Occasionally, I...